Okay, thank you all very much. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you today about our research on butterflies, of all things. So, um, as you heard, I'm a, I'm a Bauer Fellow in the Center for Systems Biology. I think you already heard a talk from Kevin Foster, maybe. He's also a fellow. And so this is sort of a unique research opportunity for young scientists. Um, it's, a very, it's a unique thing sort of across any university I've heard of where we're sort of brought in given sort of a, a somewhat like a faculty position for five years, but we're basically just out of sort of PhD and postdocs. And so we get sort of space and funding to do our science and it's, it's a, a real nice opportunity. Um, and so, as you know, this is a center for systems biology. If you've talked to any other people in this center, a lot of it is focused on sort of gen genomics and sort of biochemistry, and they use yeast as a model system very often. Um, and so we're sort of coming from a very organismal side, studying butterflies, evolution, and behavior, and sort of trying to round out the, the emphasis of the center. Um, so anyway, yeah, this is, today I'm going to talk to you about some research we've been doing focused on um, a particular process in, in um, evolutionary biology called ecological speciation. Um, and you may have read a paper, I think I, I sent a review, um, and that's, that, that review is a little sort of high end, it's, you know, there's a lot of details in there. And so I'm going to just sort of give you one concrete example of where we think we can see this process of ecological speciation actually playing out. And so I'd like to ask you to please ask questions if they come up. Um, don't, you know, let's not wait till the end. If anything comes up during, just put your hand up. And before we actually get to ecological speciation though, I just want to briefly sort of go over some, some background and, and also a little bit of history since this is kind of a nice opportunity to talk to teachers about sort of what we think about speciation and where especially Darwin stood on the issue of speciation because there's a lot of misunderstanding there. So first we're going to talk about what are species. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Darwin's view of speciation and how that's been maybe misconstrued, um, especially in, among evolutionary biologists. And then I'm going to introduce you to the idea of ecological speciation, and finally we'll get into the butterflies, this issue of um, color pattern mimicry, mate choice, and how that can actually generate new species. Uh, so first, species. What, what are species? How do we define them? And I'll just start by saying that historically there's been some debate about whether species are even real things. So we, we know, you know, there's sort of this, this Latin-based nomenclature of how we call different things different species. Um, and for, there's actually some fairly famous biologists, so one of, one of which is J.B.S. Haldane, who's a real famous sort of population geneticist. And he thought, uh, he sort of believed this, that species aren't even real things. He believed that the concept of a species is a concession to our linguistic habits and neurological mechanisms. And this is an idea that just as humans, our own evolutionary history has sort of programmed us to put things in boxes. So we look out, we may just look out at um, nature and see this continuous variation and just in our brain we want to put it into categories and so maybe species aren't real at all and everything is just fairly continuous. That's one fairly extreme idea. I'd say there probably still are biologists that believe that. Um, but now I think uh, both given a lot of the organismal and ecological work that's been done plus now sort of more modern molecular biology we see that nature is not continuous. There are discrete groups. So when we go out and we look at natural sort of populations that, of, of organisms that coexist, so like different bird communities, I'm just showing some examples on the side there, or when we go out and we take, again, co-occurring organisms, in this case butterflies, and we genotype them with many molecular markers and we look to see if we can sort of cluster them into different gene pools, what we find is that um, co-occurring organisms are not just one big cluster, right? They fall out into these discrete different morphological groups. Here they fall out into these discrete genetic groups. And it's this clustering that suggests to us that species are real things. There are real sort of defined clusters out there in nature. Um, and I will point out though that this clustering is particularly evident in sexually reproducing eukaryotic organisms. And you do find that clustering either by sort of morphology or genetics is less so in asexual organisms and prokaryotes like bacteria for instance. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about in terms of speciation today are sort of things that we can apply very clearly to sexually reproducing organisms, sort of higher organisms we think of them, and a lot of these sort of definitions break down when you start thinking about microbes. And I'm not equipped to discuss speciation of microbes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on the chart down there, the different colors kind of. Yeah, so this is, 
yes. what this defines, each of these little columns is an individual. Mm -hmm. And then what we've done is, so we've just taken three groups of butterflies, all these sort of fly around together. Actually, I'm going to show you a lot more of this stuff further on in the talk. And we've genotyped them each with thousands of molecular markers. Right, so for each of them, we have for this individual, we have at many spots across the genome, whether they have an A, a G, a T, or a C. Yeah. And then we just dump all this molecular data into this program called Structure, and we say, find how many groups these break into. And so what it's doing is it's showing for each individual the proportion of their genome that corresponds to what it found as three groups. And you can see this comes out as one group, and that corresponds to all the butterflies that look like this. This comes out as another group, and these are these bugs, and this is a third group. So this is, without me telling the program anything about what these guys look like, it finds these three distinct gene pools. And so again, we can see morphologically that these things are not continuous, they're discrete groups, and it turns out genetically they are as well. Mm -hmm. So that's how we sort of define species. But are the bars coordinated to their colors above the butterfly there? So like the red bars are from that, that guy? Exactly. So, this is 27 individuals that look like that, and each column, each column here is one individual. Oh, okay. 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 So, you know, I would say at this point, it's pretty clear that species are real thing, are real things. How do we define species then? And um, as science teachers, you may know that that is not a simple. There's no simple answer. There are at least 25 different definitions of what a species is, and I'm just listing some of the more commonly discussed um, species definitions on the side. Um, the most popular of these definitions, though, is the biological species concept. And this was popularized by this um, old Harvard biologist named Ernst Mayer. And so this is how he defined species. He said, species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. And so I will say there are, there are definitely problems with this definition, but this is sort of a, a working definition that many people that study speciation use. Um, I will point out, though, that whenever people talk about speciation, and especially the biological species concept, they always think Ernst Mayer just sort of developed this idea. And he's certainly the one that popularized it, but this, this emphasis on the ability, whether or not they can interbreed, is actually not new. If you go back to another famous biologist, Dobjansky, he said sort of something very similar. He said, a species is a group of individuals fully fertile inter se, but barred from interbreeding with other similar groups. So again, he already sort of knew that this ability of organisms to interbreed with one another was sort of a good way of defining what are species. If they can interbreed, they're sort of the same species. If they can't, then that's how we define them as being different species. And in fact, you can even find quotes from Darwin that sort of led to the same thing. Um, but as I'll show you, I mean, Darwin, he, he said a lot of stuff, but then other things, like for instance, this quote comes from some unpublished notebook of his. But he was defining species at the time as an instinctive impulse to keep separate, which no doubt be overcome, but until it is, the animals are distinct species. So again, we, you, know, you can sort of infer from that language that maybe he was starting to think along these lines as well, whether they sort of, by some instinct, prevent themselves from interbreeding with one another. Um, just to say a little bit more about Darwin and speciation, his view, I mean, his, the title of his book is The Origin of Species, right? So, we should expect that he tackled that question in the book. Um, and you know, you're going to be like, oh, that crazy Darwin. He had no idea what he was talking about on the origin of species. And in fact, a lot of evolutionary biologists believe that. Um, but actually, I think there is just some simple misunderstanding there. And Darwin actually spent a lot of time talking about the origin of species. And so this is sort of his take on how species originate is sort of confusing. And there's quite a bit of controversy. Um, and many argue that while his book says a lot about natural selection, it said little about actually the origin of species. So here's Ernst Mayer's take on it. He said, Darwin succeeded in convincing the world of the occurrence of evolution, and he found in natural selection the mechanism that is responsible for adaptation. It is not nearly so widely recognized that Darwin failed to solve the problem indicated by the title of his work. Uh, what? That's true. Like The students pick up on that, too. But wait, here's, here's, this is going to be my take home point. Darwin knew what he was talking about, and he did not mistake, he didn't make a mistake in the title of his book. Um, so here, D Mayer's view is widely accepted by evolutionary biologists. Um, and part of the problem is because Darwin himself seems to make inconsistent statements. So he says this at the beginning. 
Um, while on the Beagle, as a naturalist, I was much struck by certain facts in the distribution of the organic beings inhabiting South America. Um, these facts, as will be seen in the later chapters of this volume, seem to throw some light on the origin of species, that mystery of mysteries, as it has been called by one of the great philosophers. Um, but then later in the text, it sounds like Darwin doesn't even believe that species are real things. So he says, from these remarks it will be seen, so this is somewhere else in the book. He says, from these remarks it will be seen that I look at the term species as one arbitrarily given for the sake of convenience to a set of individuals, and that it does not essentially differ from the term variety, which is given to less distinct and more fluctuating forms. Okay, Darwin, you're not helping your case there. Um, and so what it seems to me, though, is that we're just sort of misunderstanding something very simple about our modern concept of speciation or species and what Darwin was thinking of. So you, you have to remember that back in that time, species were almost exclusively defined by morphology. And so um, similarity, so morphological similarity among organisms was used to define species, and then it was sort of dissimilarity between forms that was used to define what were different species. And so if we think of it in that terms, um, Darwin really was sort of tackling the issue of where species come from. So independently of blending from intercrossing, the complete absence in a well-investigated region of varieties linking together any two closely allied forms is probably the most important of all the criterions for their specific distinctiveness. So what Darwin was seeing, he saw speciation being the direct result of forces that drive the evolution of novel phenotypes, so natural selection. So he was asking, how do we get these new morphologies out in nature, and what sort of prevents there from being, what prevents there from being continuous variation between forms? So when Darwin was describing this process of natural selection, you know, sort of his engine of generating novelty, he was really explaining the process responsible for divergent phenotypes and thus the origin of species. Okay, so in terms of how species were defined at the time, by ex describing natural selection and the origin of adaptation, that is the origin of species. Now we have since sort of shifted our emphasis on species to reproductive isolation. You can't blame Darwin for that, right? So, and it turns out, as I'm gonna show you in a second, that even in our new understanding of speciation, Darwin was actually correct about our most critical sort of modern interpretations. Yeah. Uh, did that quote, the last one here was 1871, that's a good 12 years after he published it. Or yeah. Crazy. So I wonder if he's changing his own. Edition. He is. I think there's a lot of evidence for that. You know, you, if you look at the various um, releases of the origin, right, the, sort of the ideas and stuff are changing along the way. Um, but this sort of issue of focusing on um, sort of the evolution of novelty and then sort of saying that is the origin of new species, that was sort of there from the beginning. And that's what it, we're sort of missing because we're sort of looking at all the examples that he describes in the book are not so much about what you would call new species as just sort of about adaptive evolution. So um, Darwin recognized that species were real, but he didn't see them as special. They were just produced by the same things that generate um, within species variation, and what, that's what Darwin called varieties. And so the great thing now, it's sort of looking back and sort of as a young evolutionary biologist who sort of hasn't been in the middle of this debate about what Darwin did or did not mean or think, it's kind of interesting with modern research on speciation, we can see that Darwin was actually right about his primary two points about speciation. One is, we now know that speciation is generally the result of natural selection. Now I'm telling you that, there are evolutionary biologists that would not agree with that statement, but I think almost any example now that we can find, things where we're looking at different morphologies as I'm gonna show you soon, that generate new species, we can see how they are the result of sort of divergent natural selection. Also when people are finding the genes that cause things to stay separate, so like genes that cause forms to produce infertile hybrids for instance, we find the signature of adaptive evolution in the molecular data. So I think this is a fairly um, strong statement. So we can see this, um, it's either a direct result of natural selection or produced by some byproduct, and this occurs any, under any geographic scenario or isolating barrier. And then the second thing is that species are not special. So this sort of gets into this where some of, I think, of Darwin's language got a little iffy because species are real things. We can define them by reproductive isolation, but it's not like some special thing. They are, it's not some special evolutionary process that produces species. It's just an outcome of the regular sort of evolutionary processes that operate within species. 
It's this sort of accumulative process. If you separate two populations long enough, let them evolve independently, you are going to get speciation. So, okay, that's enough history. Let's just think about speciation, and this is going to be sort of our, our step into, finally, the butterflies. Okay, so if we go back to our modern definition of species, and here I'm just talking about the biological species concept, we'll see that species are not special, but we, they do have a defining feature, and that is reproductive isolation. And so as a speciation biologist, my interest is really in studying this process of how reproductive isolation evolves. And so here's how we sort of, a very simple schematic of how we think of this. This is a, sort of a population over time, and then here we're sort of mapping genetic distance between sort of the, the um, resultant populations. So the idea here is you've got a single interbreeding population. We call that sort of panmictic, where everybody has got an equal chance of mating with everybody else. Um, at some point in the history of that population, there's some barrier that is established. This can be an actual geographic barrier, like a mountain range comes up and separates a formerly continuous population into two, a river that sort of changes direction and cuts it. It's the Isthmus of Panama maybe coming up. It can also be behavioral or ecological, as we're going to see with the butterflies. We don't need um, geography to separate them. It can be actual some change in their biology that now prevents them from meeting up with one another. Um, and now, after they're separated, the populations d diverge genetically. They could still be reproductive, they're still reproductively compatible, meaning that if you remove this barrier, you could get them to sort of fuse and mate with one another again. Um, but after some time, if they're kept separate for long enough, these two groups will no longer be um, reproductively compatible. There will be some barrier or reproductive isolation between them. And so the thing that generates the divergence can be natural selection, it can be sexual selection, it can even be genetic drift. So we do know that if you take one interbreeding population and you just separate them physically, right, put the mountain range in between them, and just let them cook for you know, thousands or millions of generations, they're going to be independently sort of evolving. There's going to be new mutations coming up. Those are going to be spreading through the populations and fixing. And if you give them enough time and now bring them back together, they simply won't interbreed anymore. They just won't recognize one another as being potential mates. Or if they do mate, there's going to be something wrong with the hybrids. So even genetic drift can cause this process of speciation, although there are not a lot of very strong examples for genetic drift actually causing it. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about adaptation and speciation and the interplay between these. So there's sort of emerging research on a variety of biological systems which is showing a direct link between the process of adaptive evolution and speciation. And one of the clearest examples of this is this process of ecological speciation. And so the, it's sort of a, it's a fancy term for something that's fairly simple. The idea here is you get ecologically based divergent natural selection that generates reproductive isolation as a byproduct. So let me just give you a few examples, and I think these were probably discussed in the review article. So a classic example of ecological speciation is this pollinator shift in mimulus plants. And so here we've got a, these are monkey flowers. And so we've got a variety of very closely related species. These things have diverged in their um, flower color and morphology, and in shifting sort of their color and morphology, they attract a different group of pollinators. And so the pollinators, in this case, this one is visited by hummingbirds, this one is visited by bees, and those pollinators are very sort of, they have high fidelity for their particular flower morphology. So when you shift your pollinator, you essentially are just generating reproductive isolation because those pollinators are not going to the different flower types. And the group that has actually studied this group, hold on, has actually shown very nicely that you get that you're wondering where's the adaptation. They, Oh, OK. But yeah, so they've shown very nicely that you sort of get out of the range of one pollinator into the range of another. And so you sort of are exploiting this novel resource. And that's what generates the shift to a new pollinator. I was just going to ask, are they found in like the same field in the same forested area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the geography here is, is fairly complex. You, I think you get large regions, I'm guessing here. But I think you get large regions where you just find one or the other, but then there's broad areas of overlap. Okay. And so what they've actually done, the group that studies this, they have taken pure forms and they've actually generated all sorts of hybrids between these two forms by sort of cross-pollination by hand and taken them all to one field. And then they sit out there for days and weeks and they just w document which, po which pollinator species are visiting which flowers. And you can find that the hummingbirds and the bumblebees do not move between flower types. And by generating all these hybrids, they're basically able to generate all the variation between these two extreme forms. 
and they've actually found the specific traits, the color, the shape of this or that on the flower that is actually generating the sort of the preference of the pollinators. So, yeah. So, so that, you're saying that they're still the same species that's leading toward? In this case, these are actually called different species. Um, but they, are they just hybrids, you said? That? No, you can hybridize. So that's, this is where we, you're going to get, okay. So we, we are definitely going to the gray zone now. So in order to study the process of speciation, we absolutely, what we try and avoid is systems where things are obviously different species. If you start studying groups where they never interbreed and their hybrids are all messed up when they do interbreed, you've, it's already happened. You can't figure out how it happened. So what we do is we back up and we're trying to find those sweet spots between things that are clearly just panmictic and things that are clearly separated so we can sort of see how it happens. And so in this system, they're sort of close to the end of the process. You've got things that in nature, 99.9% .9 of the time they don't interbreed. So it's a very strong barrier just by shifting host plant or shifting flower morphology like that. Um, another example is um, larval host shifts in ragolitis. So this is a really nice example. These are the um, apple maggot flies. And so historically, these things are, these things are found in the New World, so they're in the U.S. The, they use as their host plant, historically, hawthorn plants. So the females find hawthorns, they lay their eggs in the little fruits of hawthorn trees, and then the larvae grow up, eat that, and then pupate, and then fly away. Um, and then, whatever, 150 years ago or 200 years ago, apple was introduced into the U.S. And these things, some populations of these, shifted their host use to apples. The interesting thing here is that the flies don't just use those host plants to lay their eggs. It's actually the males come to the host plants to find females to mate with. So when you jump to a new host plant, you basically never see the old population anymore. This group that ended up on apples, the males that sort of grew up on apples come back to apples to find females to mate with. So when you jump to a new host plant, you basically you, you are now separated from the old hawthorn ancestors. So now if you go in, around here in New England, uh, through large parts of the U.S., you find distinct populations. Some are breeding on hawthorns, some are breeding on apples, and when you genotype them, they're not interbreeding anymore. They're not hybridizing. And so this has only happened within the last 150 years. So this is a real nice example of sort of speciation in action. Okay, here's another example, um, three-spined stickleback fish. So this you may be familiar with. The idea here is that historically these um, fish invaded from marine populations into these glacial lakes and they're really famous sort of in Canada. And so these lakes were essentially unoccupied by fish that sort of live in this environment. And what has happened is there's been divergent selection. Some of these fish have specialized in sort of feeding low on the sort of down on the bottom of the lake and then other fish specialize on feeding up in sort of the surface and sort of to make a living in those two spaces you need different morphologies and so this sort of unused resource which is the lake has led to divergent natural selection some are specializing on the top some are specializing at the bottom they get they diverge in body size and morphology and then it turns out the fish actually use cues like body size in choosing mates so as they're diverging to match these two environments, they're actually, they're sort of their mate preferences diverging along with it. So this is another example where I think in all three of these examples, speciation has happened or is happening, and it really isn't, there's nothing special about the speciation. It is just simply a byproduct of the divergent select, selection to match your environment. That's sort of the take home message. And so in the butterflies, I'm gonna show you another example of this happening. So this is the group that we spent a lot of time studying. This is a neotropical group of butterflies. It's the genus Heliconius. Um, the whole genus consists of about 42 species. All the butterflies are distasteful. So they eat um, passion flower vines as caterpillars. They sequester these nasty compounds from the passion vines. And some of the species actually manufacture compounds themselves, which make them distasteful. And then they warn predators of this distasteful experience with these bright colors. So this is warning coloration, or it's called aposematism. Um, on top of that, there's actually a lot of mimicry, and it's within the genus. So you get these columns of butterflies that look identical here. These are actually distantly related species within the genus. And so this is um, called Mullerian mimicry, where you get different species that are all protected that converge on the same pattern. Okay, so this is different from 
sort of classic Batesian mimicry where you get like a perfectly delicious butterfly that evolves to look like something that is chemically protected. And so in that case, that's called Batesian mimicry. There it's sort of the mimic is stealing the signal from the model to protect itself. This is more of a mutualism we think of. So the butterflies are sort of, the idea is that by evolving a convergent color pattern, they're distributing the cost of educating predators. And so actually mathematically it works out. This was the first example of sort of modern mathematical mathematics in biology was, was Mueller figuring out that if the butterflies look alike, they'll lose less individuals. They'll basically have higher fitness than if they look different. And so the idea here is a new predator entering the population, like we think of like a young bird just growing up in the nest, first time out hunting. If these two species both are chemically protected, they look different, they're flying around, you can imagine this naive predator has got to eat some number of this one and some number of this one to learn that this guy tastes bad and then to learn that this guy tastes bad. So let's say he's got to eat five of these and five of any phenotype to learn, okay, I'm not going to eat those anymore. If these look different, he's got to eat five of these and five of these. If they look the same, though, he eats five of either one and he learns the whole group is bad. And so we've got many examples of that in Heliconius and other butterflies where you get spaces. So for instance, in the Amazon, you can go to the Amazon and find 10 butterflies. Seven of them are chemically protected. 10 butterfly species, they all look identical. Seven of those are all nasty tasting and three of those are perfectly delicious. So you've got all these chemically defended things converging on one pattern and then occasionally these perfectly edible species jumping onto those same phenotypes. But that combines the two kinds of mimicry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, you get these big complexes where... Is there any magic to the way that they're showing these in pairs? Are there really more than just pairs? Because there you're saying there's seven or more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is something, there is something special here in Heliconius where you get these pairs. Throughout most of the range, you, you do get these pairs of species that look alike, and then occasionally, like Amazon is sort of a strange example where you get many species that all converge on the same pattern. But so why, why pairs, or is that not part of I think I'm going to sh- I, oh, I may not show this. Um, so the interesting thing here is, well, part of my talk is going to be about how they use color patterns to choose mates. And it turns out that when you look at these pairs and you map them back on the phylogeny for the whole group, one member of each pair comes from each of these two major clades. And those two groups have very different breeding strategies. And so the idea here is that you can only get a member from each of the clades converging. If they were to converge between groups, they'd start getting confused and mating with each other and stuff. So that's why we think it's pairs. Yeah? So was Darwin, was Darwin confused by this then? If he was looking at solely morphology to create a species concept? Yeah, Darwin, actually, all the early naturalists were confused. So if you go back to very old butterfly collections that haven't been recurated, they have these guys in a drawer together and these guys in a drawer together, because they were just looking at the wing patterns and putting them together. Um, and now, it wasn't, I mean, it was in the, I think it was in the late 1800s or early 1900s that sort of m more modern taxonomists started looking, for instance, at genitalia and found out, wait, these things look alike in their color pattern but the rest of their morphology is very different. And they started teasing it apart and figuring out that these are really sort of distantly related. But still like based on morphology. Still based on morphology, yeah. Okay. And then ultimately, I mean, I'm imagining that they have like different like, mating patterns, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is something I'm not gonna really talk about, but the interesting thing here is one member of each of these pairs come from these two different clades. The group I'm gonna tell you about is a very young radiation. The butterflies do sort of normal courtship and mating stuff. The other group is actually this group of pupil mating butterflies where the males find the chrysalises and hang out on the female chrysalises and before the females even drop out, the males stick their abdomen through the pupil case and mate with the females. So it's a totally different breeding strategy. So did, they, did, they also, or did scientists ultimately look at that and say like, oh, here's even more evidence for different species then? Yeah, definitely, right. Um, for our purposes, this is also a great system because even though there's, there's really only 42 species, across the whole genus, there's over 500 named forms. There's a huge amount of color pattern variation within any one species in this group. So there's classic examples where um, a single species, as you move around geographically, it might have 30 different um, subspecies forms. So the color patterns change drastically, even within one thing that we call a single species. And we call it a single species because when those color pattern forms meet one another, 
you get these really broad hybrid zones where they're all mating with one another. So we sort of think of them as being single species, but they're geographically uh, variable. Um, now, in terms of how color patterning plays into speciation in this system, it's very interesting because switching color patterns for mimicry actually generates reproductive isolation in Heliconias. And it does it in two different ways. I'm going to show you examples. One is through what we call extrinsic post isolation. Um, and so this is really the hybrids may be happy and healthy in captivity, but out in nature, they're eaten by predators, and they're also not recognized as potential mates. I'll show you an example. And then also another way this happens is through pre-mating isolation. So here's the example of the first thing, this extrinsic post isolation. So here we've got two species from one of those radiations, Melpomene and Sidno. These two things are very closely related. They're partially interfertile. Um, they do meet each other, or they overlap a lot in nature. They occasionally hybridize. Um, and these things diverged in their color pattern from one another to match these two species from that other clade. And these are older species. We know now from sort of molecular, from dating on molecular phylogenies, that these things have been around a lot longer than those two. So we think of, even though they're sort of sharing their color patterns and it's a mutualistic mimicry, we still think of those as sort of being the mimics and these two being the models because they were out there in nature first. So these guys diverge in their color pattern but they still occasionally meet one another, they still occasionally hybridize, and this is what hybrids look like between them. And the interesting thing here is these hybrids pop up very infrequently. There's a small number sort of in museum collections. And when they do pop up, they don't look like mom and they don't look like dad. And so what we think happens to these hybrids in nature is that the predators who've already learned that this is bad, this is bad, oh, this is new, I'll try that. So we think they probably get whacked by predators. Um, and then the other thing is they're also not recognized as potential mates. So we've already, we've done mate choice experiments and some other labs have done mate choice experiments here and shown that when you put these sort of in mating trials with these guys, these guys are sort of, um, they're not selected as potential mates because the butterflies are using these color patterns and choosing mates. Yeah. Do the hybrids select each other? Yeah, so they do. They do select each other, but it's more because they're not mating with anybody else, I think. <laughs> So they just feel left out. So they find each other, and then they mate. They can, but they can reproduce. They can't. Well, so in this system, these guys are a little bit more diverged than the system I'm going to tell you about next. So they do interbreed. Um, they produce both male and female offspring, um, but only the males are fertile. The females are infertile. Okay. Um, here's another example. And this is a system we've studied a lot in Costa Rica. We've got this yellow species and white species. Again, this is the same white species as up there. And these things are actually even more closely related than those two. It's like these two are sister species, and then that red one is sort of the next group out. And so these two, again, diverged from one another in color pattern to match these older models. And as I'm going to show you, these two species use their color pattern difference um, in choosing mates. And these, these two are actually so closely related that they're totally interfertile. So if we bring them out of nature into the lab, it's very easy to hybridize them, and their hybrids are totally viable, totally fertile, males and females. Um, oh, well, yeah, so here's the whole system. So in Costa Rica, this yellow one is Pachinus, the white one is Sidno. They diverge from one another, we think about a half a million years ago, to match these older species that occur on their sides. So what I think happened is, you know, about a half a million years ago, the ancestor of Pachinus and Sidno floated into Costa Rica. Those individuals that ended up on one coast experienced selection to match this local model. Those that ended up on the other coast experienced divergent natural selection to match that model. And so that's why today we have on opposite sides of the country these two different phenotypes. Um, and most, through most of their range, they're separated by this mountain range that runs down the middle of Costa Rica. But right in the Central Valley, the mountains get low enough, the two butterflies meet each other, and there is sort of a diffuse hybrid zone there. Um, any other details? So as I said, they're totally interfertile. So if we bring them out of nature, if we bring them away, you know, grab them from the two coasts, bring them into the greenhouse, they hybrid, we can get them to hybridize with one another, and there's nothing wrong with their hybrids. But, so, but they're considered separate even though they're alike enough that they do that, and they still overlap a little bit of range? They still yeah. are considered separate? Yeah. So they're called different species. You know, how much of that is history? Some of that is historical because they just look so different. And so like the early taxonomists were like, clearly these are different species. Now I'd say they're sort of in the gray zone between what you would call separate species and what we call sort of these geographic subspecies between the other things. 
because they're sort of in the middle there. But as I'm going to show you, they give us a very nice window of how this whole process is playing out. Yeah. Did anyone ever look at like the original two species, the, um, I can't pronounce it, but the original two that the mimics came yeah. from? And were they also in a similar situation that they might have been a similar morph to begin with and then? Yeah, oh, that's actually a good point. So these models here are part of a sa the same sort of little subclade within the genus. So these guys do share, you know, in the big scheme of things, a relatively recent common ancestor. But it's still two or three times older than the ancestor of these two. So somewhere back in history, yeah, these two did share an ancestor and then they split. Um, but these guys, they're different in a lot of ways. They have a different number of chromosomes. They, they don't interbreed with each other. Um, well, occasionally in the greenhouse, we can get them to mate with one another, but they don't produce any hybrids. Did you have a question? Yeah, if, if you took five or ten of each of those two species and put them in the greenhouse, mm -hmm. would they interbreed? Or if they have the opportunity to mate? Oh, I'm going to show you the experiments. I'm going to show you the experiments. Yeah. And is there any way of identifying the initial selective pressure that would have led to the, the models being different? The models being different. Is that yeah. I mean, flora? And, I'm going to <laughs> We get around that problem by studying the young group. Um, seriously, there is a huge mystery in this whole system. You've got all this color pattern variation. We're studying the young group, so we know why they all diverge from one another. It's to match the old group. What happened to the old group? We have no idea. That is a big mystery here. Why on earth did you get all this variation in the old group to begin with? I don't know. Because it would seem like if you're looking at Valerian, you would have almost like a It's a big problem. It's, it's more, number one, just warning coloration by itself selects for stabilization, right? If you've got this big population that all look alike and they're protected and the birds know them, anything that looks different should get whacked, right? So how do you go from an ancestor that looked one way to all this variation? And then on top of that, because of malarian mimicry, even if they separate, they should get pushed back together. But yet there's all this diversification. We don't know the answer. Um, so if we look at those young species, Sidnopachinus, the yellow and white ones, um, so one thing I did initially was a simple mating experiment. So I did these tetrads where I took a uh, male and female of the yellow species, a male and female of the white species, put them together in a cage, um, and just watched, this sounds creepy, but watch them, <laughs> watch them until a couple m starts mating. And then I just record, is it a mating between species or within species? And so I did this experiment 75 times, <laughs> spent many days just staring at these poor bugs. Um, and it turns out, out of those 75 times, 12 times they mated between species, 63 times they mated within species. So clearly they're not highly averse to interbreeding, but there is significant assortative mating. Um, the next thing I did is I did a simple experiment, again, this is even creepier, where I took dead females of the two species. So I took a yellow female and a white female, and these are like out of museum drawers. So they've got, a, you know, they're got a pin through them, they got their wings out to the side, they're dried up. And I put them side by side on a leaf in a population cage. First I went into the Sidno, the white Sidno population, put them side by side, and then I went into the yellow Pachinus cage. So it's a bunch of males and females of that one species all flying around. And I just watched what the males, how the males responded to these two females. And basically what will happen is the males will fly up, they'll approach one, but they don't really court them. The males sort of get close and they realize that I'm playing a trick on them and then they fly away. So, but the cr crazy thing here is that the males make really strong choices. So out of this experiment, out of 140 approaches by 69 males, there was only one mistake, where in this case, one Sidno flew up to the Pachinus female. Every other flyby was assortative. So all the other Sidno approaches were to the white Sidno female, all the other Pachinus approaches were to the yellow Pachinus female. And these two butterflies are sitting like that far apart on a leaf. And so the idea is the males are sort of flying up, they can see both, and they zip past one or they zip past the other. Um, and I will point out that I'm actually, for this experiment, I'm building on some work from collaborators where they started with, those, with, that, with the white species, Sidno, and the red species, Melpomene, so it's a little bit more distantly related. And they actually took photographs of the butterflies and cut the pictures out and shook them in cages and showed that the males would fly up to pictures of wings that match their own versus the others. So we already knew that there was some strong visual component. And so what I'm asking here is, what is that visual component? Again, there's something clearly going on here. To figure out what the males are actually queuing in on, 
I then offered males these combinations of color and pattern. So here, I experimentally altered color and pattern to give males the four possible combinations. And then for this experiment, I offered males a regular white Sydno female, a regular yellow Pachinus female, and then these are actually the wings of an F1 hybrid between the two. So again, these are females. And again, these are all dead females pinned. So these four are sort of put on a square pattern like that on a leaf. These three are put side by side on a leaf. And then we just again watch who are the males flying up to. And the answer is actually very simple. Males are choosing based on color. So in this experiment, males of the pure white species are flying up to both white females and avoiding both yellow females. And the males of the yellow species are flying up to both yellow females and avoiding both white ones. And then in this experiment, males of both species are treating these two the same. So white males go up to the F1 hybrids like they do their own, and again, they avoid the yellow ones. And males of the yellow species go up to their own and avoid both white ones. So it doesn't matter what we do to pattern here, the males are just looking at color. So the next thing we did is since we were generating these hybrids anyway, because another sort of question is, well, what's the genetic basis of this color difference? So we were generating hybrids to do basic sort of genetic mapping of color and color pattern. Um, and I also took all these hybrids and threw them into this mate choice experiment to get an idea of how mate preference segregates in these broods. So what I did is, this is a slightly different experiment where I took a bunch of males, so these are pure males from the two species and all sorts of hybrids of theirs. I throw them into a cage together, and then I actually go in with a live female of the two species. So a live virgin white female, a live virgin yellow female. Put them in at the same time, and then watch who the males court. And the idea here is, we want for each male a very nice quantitative score of his individual preference. And so with those prior experiments, the males would fly by once, maybe they'd fly by again, and then they catch on and they realize that this is a big joke, and they stop flying by. But what we want is we want, to get a male's, we want to get a male to choose a female 20, 30, 40 times so we can get a real nice quantitative score of his individual preference. And in this mate choice experiment, when you offer a bunch of males who have been sitting in a cage for weeks, live females, they go nuts. And they'll court again and again and again and again. So here what we do then is we take for each male, we calculate their preference. And that's just the number of times they courted the white female divided by their total number of courtships. So here, a preference score of 1 means that a male has complete preference for white. A preference score of 0 means a male has complete preference for yellow. And so you can see, these are the two pure species. They sort out very nicely. White males prefer white. Yellow males prefer yellow. These are the F1 hybrid males. They have absolutely zero preference. Those males will go to one female, and then they'll fly over to the next one. And they'll fly back, and then they'll go over to the next one. 50-50. These are actually F1 hybrids if we reverse the direction of the cross. So again, it's intermediate. It's a little sort of shifted in one direction. I don't know what to make of that. Here's where it gets very interesting. It turns out that in the F2 hybrid, so this is when you take an F1 mom and an F1 dad and you mate them with one another. So now you get this big pool of segregating hybrids that are all brothers and sisters, but they're, you're getting all this recombination between the two pure species. There's actually a significant association between whether, whether a male had a yellow or white wing and whether he preferred yellow or white females. These things are actually segregating together in the cross. And when we do sort of standard genetic mapping, this is called quantitative trait mapping, it turns out here is the chromosome of the 21 chromosomes that the butterflies have. Here's the chromosome where the color gene itself is. It turns out that color is a, single, is a single gene switch. There's a dominant white allele, a recessive yellow allele, and it segregates one to one in these back, in back cross hybrids. So it's a single Mendelian switch that controls whether the butterfly is white or yellow. Here is that gene on our genetic map. And then here's the association with mate preference. There's no association anywhere else in the genome. There's no association on this part of the chromosome. But there's this strong effect of some, some spot around the color gene actually controls a male's color preference. So here we've got, we know the trait that the males are queuing in on. We can watch the segregation of the preference in the broods, and it turns out that these two things are very tightly linked. So the, sort of this whole system of mimicry and mate choice is all coalescing to this one end of this one chromosome. Something crazy is going on here. Um, however, I will point out that like other examples of ecological speciation, Sydno and Pachinus are pretty far down the path of divergence. So they are getting toward, they're moving out of the gray zone into things that we would think of as good species. 
They are, their hybrids aren't messed up when they interbreed, but if you ask what's happening out in nature, or even artificially when we bring them together, the reproductive isolation between them is fairly strong. So we wanted something even more in the gray zone to figure out how this whole thing gets started. So here what we've done is we've actually shifted systems. So this is the whole system I've been telling you about in Costa Rica. If you go to Western Ecuador, the species that we've been studying in Costa Rica that's white, it also occurs in Ecuador, but there it's polymorphic. There's a white form and a yellow form, and each of these two forms is mimicking a different model. So it's actually the same white species that's the model in Costa Rica, is also in Western Ecuador, that's Heliconia sapho. There's a new yellow one, Heliconia salutia. But again, this whole group is part of some you know, old clade in Heliconius. This is a single species, Heliconia sydno, that's polymorphic. And these guys, you go to one spot in Western Ecuador, you can catch these and these all flying around together. If you catch females in nature of this form and females of this form, you take them back to the greenhouse, they both, females of both colors produce offspring of both colors. So we know they're interbreeding with one another in nature. And we actually think it's the, exactly the same gene that causes the color switch. Because again, there's the same rules. It's a single Mendelian switch. There's a dominant white allele, a recessive yellow allele. And now we've done genetic mapping in this system and shown that again, that color switch, which we call K, is very tightly linked to this molecular marker, wingless. So it's linked and it has the same sort of dominance hierarchy here. It's linked and it has the same dominance hierarchy here. The difference is these are sort of two pure populations on the two sides of the mountains. This is that same color difference segregating in one panmictic population. Now the question becomes, what happens? If there really is this association between a male's color and his color preference, what happens when we go to this polymorphic population? Do they also show preference when given the choice? And so what we did is we went to Ecuador, we went to Western Ecuador, and we set up these experimental cages on a butterfly farm. Um, this guy has this huge butterfly farm in Western Ecuador, and so he's raising Heliconius butterflies. He's selling them to public exhibits in the U.S., so he'll ship you a box of pupae. If you've been to the Museum of Science here, they've got like a butterfly room. There's lots of these public exhibits. So he's raising probably, I don't know, 30 to 50% of all the butterflies you see in these public exhibits. And so we met him on one of our initial trips. We told him about the experiment. He said, sure, come here, set up your experiments here. So then we went around to areas around the butterfly farm and collected wild Aletheia males. That's this polymorphic population. These butterflies are not terribly common. So in the two months that we spent in Ecuador, we only collected 36 wild males, right? That's not great numbers. Luckily, the butterfly farmer has a captive population of the polymorphic population. And he said, come in, take them. So we pulled 139 males. Maybe he shouldn't see this on the web. Um, we, yeah, so we pulled 139 males from his captive population and also threw those in the cages for the experiment. And then we tested courtship preference the same way we did in the pure species. We threw all these guys in the cage. Here are two postdocs from my lab actually in there. And then each day they would go in for a few hours and release one yellow virgin female, one white virgin female. And again, we're just watching male court, males court. And so here's a video of this actually happening. So here's the yellow female on this day. She's sitting on a leaf. Somewhere else in this cage is the white female flying around. And then here comes a male to uh, check her out. And so this is real classic courtship behavior. And so basically we let it go for a few seconds to just get, make sure that it isn't some flyby, that this is a real sort of courtship, real interest. And once we're assured of that, then we reach in and stop the action. Because we don't actually want them to mate, because we want to use that female again and again for the experiments. Um, here's another example. Here's the female sort of looking out at us, and the male's going to come over on the top. Did you videotape everything? No. Just these two. So they have, this is a very distinctive sort of flying behavior that the males do. They don't fly like this ordinarily. Usually they're just shooting across. And, oh, fumble. So, he <laughs> so the idea is all the males in that cage have a number written on their wing with a Sharpie marker. So we know who every male is. As the male flies up and courts, we let it go for a few seconds, make sure that it's real interest, and then we grab the male, and we just write down, okay, male 27 courted the white female. And we do this. I mean, I was there for two weeks out of the two months. The poor postdocs lived in that cage for two months with these butterflies doing this hours and hours and hours. But in the end, it paid off. 
So let me show you the results. So again, these are the results for the two pure species in Costa Rica. Again, they separate out very nicely with the same preference index. Here's what things look like in Ecuador. Again, there's, there's a lot more overlap. That's not surprising, because again, this is a single interbreeding population. But you can see that these two distributions do not overlap perfectly. There is a difference between white and yellow males. So in the end, they recorded 1,644 courtships by 115 males. That's a lot of data. It turns out that yes, white and yellow males do differ in their preference. Yellow males prefer to court yellow females. So this distribution is significantly sort of shifted towards yellow preference. It turns out, though, that white males do not have a statistically significant preference. So even though it seems to me this, pref this distribution is shifted that way. We've got white males only over here. There's no white males at a perfect yellow preference. But it's not statistically significant. And I will point out that, oh, and I should also say there's no effect of, male, of captivity on male preference. So we compared the wild-caught males to all those um, captive population males, and their distributions were not different. So we can feel comfortable in pooling those two data sets. I will point out, oh, actually, so I think we, do we have to finish? No. Okay. <laughs> you guys are like, uh, really? Okay. Um, I, we don't have much further to go, though. So, um, one question we had here is what is the mechanism that's causing preference to be associated with color? You know, we look at that system and think of it as one big interbreeding population with these two forms, but it is possible. I mean, nobody has really carefully studied. Maybe we have sort of two things that look alike, that overlap, but they really don't interbreed that much. So this is one question we had in the back of our mind. So to get at that, we just went and did a lot of molecular genetics to see if we could tease them apart. So we tested this. We used a bunch of population genetic data. We generated AFLP markers. We sequenced mitochondrial DNA. Um, and what we found is we did this for both the white and yellow forms from Ecuador, and then almost sort of as a control, we also did it for those two species in Costa Rica. And it turns out that there's very strong genetic differentiation between our geographic groups, but there's no difference between white and yellow butterflies from Ecuador. So here, the color coding indicates the color of the individual. And so these triangle things are the two groups. This is the yellow group from Costa Rica. This is the white group from Costa Rica. And then here, all interdigitated are the white and yellow butterflies from Ecuador. And so these are based on AFLP data. These are the same sort of structure plots I was describing way in the beginning, where we asked the program to cluster based on the genetic data. Again, we get three groups. But these, no matter what we do, we cannot get these white and yellow butterflies to separate out as separate groups. Yeah? Do you think that's a necessity based on numbers in the population? Because you said you only found 36 males over that period of time. Is it just the population so small that they can't quite find another mate so color doesn't make any difference? That is exactly what we think happens. So we went there and we carefully asked males, what do you prefer? And indeed, we found preference. Right. Right. But in nature, the reason this, these guys aren't separated right now is because in nature, that preference, I don't really even think gets a chance to play out. Because the preference is there. It's clearly very subtle. And males are rarely encountering females, much less virgin females. And I don't see the yellow male saying, ah, you know, I'm going to pass up this white female because you know, at, he may never see another virgin female for the rest of his life. So I think in nature, they don't actually get a chance to play out this preference. And that's why they're still sort of fully interbreeding. And how long do they live? How long do they? Um, the, as a, so it takes them a month to grow up. And then they come out as an adult. And as adults, they can live for months. Yeah, so they're very long-lived butterflies. They actually eat pollen, and that's a huge source of nitrogen. It's an unlike other butterflies. Yeah? So, so what is the, I mean, how, how do they even know what color they are? So what do you think the yeah. preference is based on? Well, I'm going to show you some stuff in a second, OK? And the point is they don't know what color they are. <laughs> I'm going to show you, because we've actually looked at maybe how do we know the males are not learning their own color, and that's what's defining their preference. Because that's another thing. If males just learned. Like if males, because they're looking at their wing all day. So if males are looking at their wing and learning to associate this color with you know, preference, that would be a real strong way to get this apparent linkage between color and preference. But they're not learning. Yeah. How often do the females actually mate in their lifetime? They just mate once? Yeah, so in this group, females do, they can remate, but they'll mate once. Even in this group that sort of does this normal mating stuff, usually what we think happens in nature is the females are closed from the chrysalis, and very quickly a male finds them, mates with them. They may never remate. Mm 
or they may remate maybe once in their life. So I was just curious so a, that maybe if you took like, you know, if there was like a virgin female and one that had already mated, you know, what, what effect that would have on it if you said they're really attracted to like... Yeah, well, we, the reason we use virgin females is because the males, when they mate with the females, they give them, they give them uh, what's called a spermatophore. And so this has got nutrients, it's got sperm, and it's also got a thing called an anti-aphrodisiac. So the males are actually passing on chemicals that make the female smell like a male. And that's basically to ward off future mates. So if you take already mated females and use them in, in the experiment, number one, you get fewer courtships, and we don't know what effect the previous male mating is going to have on future male interest. So there is a well-documented sort of transfer of this anti-aphrodisiac. Okay, so anyway, there is no genetic differentiation between white and yellow butterflies in Ecuador. So our inference from this is that it really is a single interbreeding population. So could males be recognizing their own color and choosing females based on those that match. So this is called self-referent phenotype matching. And this could be males looking at their own wing. Males could be somehow imprinting on their mother. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways this could play out. How, what role does sort of experience and learning play? We, I can already tell you that we know this does not happen in the Costa Rican populations. Because, as I showed you, the pure species have very strong preference for their own. But when you generate an F1 hybrid, which based on the, the genetics, the dominance hierarchy, they themselves are white, but they have no preference for white. So we know these F1 hybrids are not looking at their white, white wing and deciding to go after white females. They have perfectly intermediate preference. So this tells us that males are not learning their own color, um, that genetic variation for preference is perfectly additive because there's no sort of dominance there. Um, and that actually, our data from this polymorphic population agrees with that because, remember, we found that yellow males as a whole had a preference for yellow. White males did not. So again, if butterflies are looking at their own wing and learning that color, we would expect a similarly strong preference among the white butterflies as we found among the yellow butterflies. But we found preference in one and not in the other. So again, that argues that males are not learning this color preference. Actually, our data for Alethea are very consistent with this idea of genetic linkage. Because remember, here basically what we're saying is that the color gene and the preference gene are moving together in the hybrids. And so basically, what you can do here is you can take a butterfly's color and use it to predict their preference. Um, and so remember that um, because white is dominant to yellow, when we were doing those experiments in, in the polymorphic population, a huge number of those white butterflies that we were testing are actually heterozygous at color. And if your color genotype predicts your preference, we would expect from this result that any male that's heterozygous at color should not have a preference. And so what we're doing is we're taking a bunch of yellow males that we predict to have a strong yellow preference, testing them, and indeed they do. Then we're taking this mishmash pool of white males, most of which are heterozygous at color, and find that they don't have a preference, which is exactly what we expect based on this result. So in the end, I think the data are pretty consistent, and this is just what I was saying there. So what we think we have found in this polymorphic population is sort of a missing link in the process of ecological speciation. So in this system, we've got mimicry-based assortative mate preference, and this meets two basic criteria. It's the reason those butterflies look different, the white and yellow ones, is because of divergent natural selection to match different models. And when you shift your color, you also shift some component of reproductive that generates reproductive isolation, in this case, preference. So these sort of, these are the same two things that are sort of causing speciation in Costa Rica. And in this polymorphic population, we already see that process starting to happen. Um, so this does seem qualitatively different from what's going on in Costa Rica. It's sort of an earlier step. It's also very different from other examples that are discussed in terms of ecological speciation. So when we started studying this, we thought maybe we had uncovered a unique, very early stage in the process. And so to actually quantify this, so this actually is... You can imagine how this works. So we, we wrote a paper about this whole thing. We sent it to a prestigious journal, and they said, this is very interesting, but there's many examples of ecological speciation. Reject. Boom. And so we got the re reviews back. I was like, no way. I mean, this is, yes, this is something we think is going to be ecological speciation, but this is before. This is a polymorphic population that is going to move in that direction. This is something very different. So then what we did is we actually tried to prove that. So we went into the literature. We identified 19 other biological systems that provide nice examples of e ecological speciation. This, the question is simply, how is our system the same or different from those other examples? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show you these other systems. Mimulus, you've already seen. Ragalitis, three-spined sticklebacks. This is the system from Costa Rica. 
This is the little bit more divergent system that I was telling you about. Here's another Heliconia system. This is actually from the old radiation. These two species meet and hybridize. There's this um, classic fish example. These Hawea palms, um, Astrinia, Nicaraguan cichlids, P. aphids, poison dart, flog, dart frogs, Anthoxanthum. Uh, there's a huge literature on each of these systems. So to you, it may seem like this crazy mishmash of systems, but each of these is sort of important in the field of ecological or sympatric speciation. More cichlids, Gambusia, Litorina, walking sticks, the large bud moth, these buntings. I'm just giving you a, okay, so those are all the systems. So that plus this polymorphic population makes 20. And so what we did is we took each of these systems and we just, based on reading the papers and then our own work on the uh, couple Heliconius examples, we scored them for these different traits. So one question is, is there evidence for ecological selection? You'll notice everybody's a yes. The only way to get on the table is if you're a yes. Okay, so anybody who was a no is out. Um, and then we asked, what are the number of divergent traits? So people that have studied these systems, how many traits are they different at? Um, what is the genetic basis of this trait? Um, is there any post-psychotic isolation, meaning is there something intrinsically wrong with the hybrids, and whether that's intrinsic or extrinsic? Is there evidence for mate preference, assortative mating? Are the populations spatially segregated? Are they like in Costa Rica where it's sort of parapatric, or is it like in Aletheia where they're sympatric? Um, and then is there evidence for genetic differentiation, either at mitochondrial DNA or nuclear markers? So we scored them all for these various criteria. And then we summarized those 10 criteria into these five categorical, categorical variables. So we've got, we just numbered each of the systems, one through 20. How many, what are the number of divergent traits? We just sort of summarized that. The genetic basis of those traits, whether there's any post-psychotic isolation spatial segregation, and strength of genetic differentiation. And it turns out when you use these in sort of a principal component type analysis, for this we used MCA, this is what you get. So our polymorphic population is different. <laughs> That's all I can say. So these are all the other systems. Number five is Sidno and Pachinus from Costa Rica. So they sort of fall with all these others. Um, and then Aletheia is different from the rest. And so the big difference here this difference is primarily along this first axis, and that's really a result of Aletheia's single locus genetic basis. Remember, it's a single gene, white versus yellow. Um, the fact that there's no evidence for genetic differentiation between them, and there's no post-psychotic isolation. So they're, clearly their hybrids are viable and fertile. And there's also no extrinsic post-psychotic isolation, because if the white and yellow forms mate with each other, and they produce a white offspring, the white one is protected by mimicry with the white model. If they produce a yellow offspring, the yellow one is predict predicted by its mimicry of the yellow model. So there is nothing wrong with the hybrids. So our conclusion then is that mimicry-based mate preference in this polymorphic interbreeding populations of butterflies gives us sort of a first time look at this very early step in the process of ecological speciation. And what we think we found here is a missing link between these extremes of panmixia and sort of good isolated species. So with that, I'm going to wrap up by thanking the people, especially Nicola and Ryan, who are the postdocs that lived in that cage. Um, also collaborators, Larry and Durrell. Jacob Olander is the one that runs this butterfly farm. And then, of course, I have to thank Harvard and the NIH for funding. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Did you resubmit your article? We did, yeah. So it was accepted. So this came out. this came out... Um, in November in science. So science is like one of the holy trinity of journals. So. Did you resubmit it with all the extra? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we originally submitted it, uh, as I told you, and they said, this is interesting, but we already know this. Um, and I actually wrote back to the editor, and I said, well, actually, we think this is different, and we're going to try and prove it to you. Would you consider looking at it again? And they said yes, which I, wasn't, I was sort of surprised. But they agreed to take another look at it. and. Um, we did run into a little trouble with that thing because clearly some of the reviewers were people that study these other systems. So in their reviews the second time, they were like, well, you got this wrong, you got this wrong, you got this wrong. So it took a long time to sort of convince them that really we were summarizing things correctly. Um, yeah. And we had to move that whole analysis to the supplement. Like, we originally had it in the main paper and it was sort of too controversial. So, yeah. Wait, so all of those other people that have found similar things, that was all recent too, because they also did, because at, at first I thought in the chart you said like polygenic question mark, 
and then it went to yes. So when you were looking at the Oh, that's good. Survey. Yeah, so that's though it's things like that where we ran into trouble because there are spots where the most you have to go on is what some some expert in the system speculated in one sentence in a paper because the number of systems where people have crossed them and done detailed genetic work to figure out the genetic basis of these traits, not a lot of them we right, have. Because it would have to be fairly recent that people would. Yeah, well, most of these systems have been studied quite heavily in recent years. But like the palm trees, nobody's interbreeding those and figuring out the genetic basis of their differences. Yeah. So we have to, in some cases, we're taking their their wild speculation or our inference about. You know, if, if the two Hawea palm trees differ in 10 characteristics, it's unlikely that a single gene controls all those differences. Yeah. So in some systems, we had to make um, our own inference. In other cases, we were able to point back at experts in those systems, mm -hmm. hypothesizing about the genetic basis. Mm -hmm. There was, those are sort of the spots where you get into some iffiness. But we were just trying to fill in as many parts of that table for as many systems as possible. So is this ecological speciation, uh, is St. Patrick's, is those synonymous? Uh, it's not necessarily. So there are examples of, there are good examples of ecological speciation where the things are not, um, are no longer in contact, like allopatric speciation. The reason people are so excited about it, though, is because it does offer a real possible avenue for sympatric speciation. So sympatric just means that without the geographic barriers, can you get one thing to separate into two species? That's been sort of a long, drawn out argument about how likely it is. It seems now, I mean, I think most of the examples on this list are also sort of, we keyed in on them because they're sort of, there's a history of studying them in terms of sympatric speciation. Um, but there are other examples. So like one of the examples here, um, Gambusia, where the people that are studying those, they're in different little lakes and they don't, in, they don't meet each other, but you can actually identify sort of the selection pressures that are pushing them in different directions. So. Just, just one more thing. What's the time frame from um, doing the study and then actually getting the published document? Um, well, it's really variable. Because um, it, in this case, we were in Ecuador in October of 2008, and the paper actually was published in November 2009. So that's a year. But that's, I mean, we submitted our first version like a few months after the experiment, just because we were keyed up to get it out there, because we thought we were onto something. And then we went through, through this whole rigmarole with um, no, yes, and that sort of stuff. So, um, but it's really variable. This stuff, this question of the genetic basis of the color and preference, you know, I've been working on that for years now, um, doing the initial crosses sort of during my PhD, and now we're still in the lab, sequencing, genotyping, narrowing down the interval. And we finally now have sort of the color gene isolated to a handful of possible genes. But there's a system where we've been working on it for years and years and years. And hopefully in the next few years, we'll have a paper that really nails it down. So some projects go very quick. Others take a long time. Um, and I'm just going to finish up uh, by saying that this system of ecological speciation, again, to be totally fair, we don't know whether those two color forms in Ecuador are going to, down the road, become different species. We are finding a model of how it probably plays out. And here we have a nice example of how just the jumping color by itself, for no other reason, also causes you to jump preference. So we think that's an important part in the process. If we were able to live you know, for thousands or millions of butterfly generations, we could test this and see whether Aletheia morphs actually become separate species. At the moment, they're clearly one species. Um, and so we think we sort of found a pattern of how it happens. But whether those two guys are actually going to form different species in the future, we don't know. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Thank